Okay. Are we live? Yeah. In one minute. Hold on. I'll give you a thumbs up. Oh, God. Real. Get in there. Okay. Here we go. And we're live. Are we? We are. Go ahead. Hi. Welcome, everybody. It's Kevin Bradley here with another Awake Facebook Live event. Um, wow. It seems a while since we've done one of these. Um, but I am delighted to welcome Cindy Michaels, who's um, a respiratory therapist. And for the past 10 years, or for not the past 10 years, sorry, she was working as a respiratory therapist for 10 years. And then she moved to a sleep lab that she's been working for for the past 19 years. So Cindy is also running um, an awake group. So we decided, Justine, Teresa, and I, in the summer of last year, that we would put out a new curriculum for coordinators that are running groups like Cindy does. And, um, you know, we hope that this will be helpful for people. We decided to do this because, I guess, you know, we wanted to make our message inconsistent. Uh, this module, the first module, is obviously for newly diagnosed patients that have just been diagnosed with a sleep apnea disorder, for the want of a better word. But we encourage everybody to stay on, you know, and watch the uh, presentation because, you know, we can answer questions and um, look at things of trying to overcome problems when even newly diagnosed people have. But some people we see in our Facebook Live um, questionnaires that some people are still struggling, like they're newly diagnosed. So Cindy, I will hand it over to you. And um, if you want to just tell me a little bit about yourself, even though I introduced you, and um, start by talking about how you run your groups. Sure. Um, so I, um, I've been doing it for, I think, since 2007, um, running support groups. And um, we do um, have between 25 and people who, 25 and 50 people who come um, yeah. to the meetings, and it's um, quarterly. So um, you know, I think it's a it's a pretty good group, and and um, you know, everybody talking together is um, very important. And also, um, a lot of the um, DMEs and manufacturers also come. To the meetings and um, they, um, you know, the, the attendees really like to speak to them as well. Great. But I think, you know, one of the, the good things about your groups is, you know, you also help people navigate through the system, which we'll get to later. And I think it's very important as well that you also follow up with people's adherence. So, you know, can you tell me a little about how you do that? Um, yeah, that, that's actually a little more tricky, um, but we, we try um, to, you know, check on their compliance. Um, a lot of the stuff now is, is on, on the computer. So, um, you know, with, with um, the different manufacturers, they have their own stuff on the computer. So, um, you know, the patients can go in and look and see, you know, what they're doing just as well as we can. Um, we have a clinic that we um, have the patients come to if they're having issues. And we also have them come to the clinic to see the, um, our sleep doctor. Great. That's a great service. You know, and I think, you know, the slide I'm hoping, you know, obviously people can see. So, you know, when someone's just prescribed uh, a CPAP machine, what's next? And Cindy, I'll let you take it away. Like you're, you're running your presentation. All right. So um, I just wanted to say thank you for inviting me to speak this evening. Um, oh, I appreciate you, you coming along. And I actually yeah. meant to say that earlier. It's nice when, sorry, you know, we reach out to people in our group and people are willing to do this because not everybody <laughs> likes to come on camera. And so we're very thankful to have you. Thank you yes. for joining. Thank you. Yes, and I'm thank happy you. as well to have Justine Amder on board. Welcome, Justine, back from Tahoe. So 
Justine will chime in as well um, and we'll take questions. Please send us your questions because we want to make sure we um, can try and have the best out of this as we possibly can. Yes. Okay, I'll move to the next slide. All right, so you were diagnosed with sleep apnea or SA and was prescribed a positive airway pressure or a PAP machine. Now what? So I remember when I was first diagnosed, um, my thought was, you know, oh no, now I'm gonna have to wear one of those crazy looking machines and the masks and, you know, trying to figure all that stuff out. Um, and I'm sure other people, you know, felt the same way. Um, next slide. So um, it is very important to understand your diagnosis. There are so many medical terms thrown at you. Um, sometimes it's hard to know what the doctor is talking about, especially with all the abbreviations. Um, but the first thing you wanna do is find out what is your main problem. So for the majority with sleep apnea, the main problem is you either stop breathing and or your breathing is so shallow, it lowers your oxygen level while you're sleeping. So the first thing you need to do is have a face-to-face -face with your, um, appointment with your doctor and um, make sure that you ask your doctor uh, as many questions as you need to. Do not feel rushed at all. And if you don't understand the answers, ask again. Um, ask about PAP and what it is how long it will take to get your machine, who will give you your machine. Um, the doctor usually calls a DME, which is Dur Durable Medical Equipment Company, or an HME, a home medical equipment company, who will either bring your machine to you or you'll go to the company and get it. And even sometimes it's mailed to you. Um, but I would definitely ask the name and the phone number of the company in my experience, uh, sometimes it can take two to three months to get set up with the equipment. Uh, you're waiting for the doctor's office uh, to send the prescription, the insurance company approving it, the company getting in touch with you, and then making an appointment that's gonna fit your schedule. So sometimes that, that all that together can take a really long time. Um, right, right. But, and, you know, not to interrupt you there, but I think that's, you know, when, with anyone who's been given a new quote unquote diagnosis, it's very overwhelming. <clears throat> and I think, you know, in this day and age, you know, it's nice to be able to sit and think about what's going on with my condition. What can I ask the doctor? Write down notes. Um, it's very beneficial if you can bring someone with you to an appointment because sometimes we're all very, you know, foggy about, oh, this is affecting me, but somebody else may be able to act as your advocate. And, you know, take notes as well while you're at the doctor's office to make sure you're getting the treatment and, um, you know, everything that you need answered, because that's an, a very important visit. And you need to understand what the implications are of having a new diagnosis. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, so make sure, you know, that you ask for the name and the number before you leave, because um, you don't you don't want to get lost in the shuffle either. Sure, um, sure. And, 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 you know, Justin, I know we've all been there, you know, we've sat in doctor's offices and, you know, you've been told something, you know, any experience or, you know, like that you can shed on that experience that you had? Yeah, I think one of the things that you said about, you know, kind of having a little bit of that brain brain fog and trying yeah. to understand, you know, what's going on that happens with a lot of health conditions and especially with people that have sleep apnea because for the most obvious reason you're not sleeping well and so, you know, that's where the brain fog comes from. You know, you're just tired, fatigued. And so, you know, you can't remember certain little details. So either writing everything down, uh, if you can't have someone go with you or bringing someone, I think that's a great suggestion. And um, also, I just want to mention that, you know, our, our conversation today uh, that we're having with you on Facebook and, you know, with, with Kevin and Cindy here is very similar to um, 
our AWAKE program, our nationwide peer-to-peer -peer, uh, support groups uh, like Cindy has in her area. And these are the types of conversations that take place there. So maybe take a look to see if there's something in your area or if there's not, you know, go ahead and, and consider maybe starting one or talking to your doctor because it is helpful to hear uh, other patients' stories uh, and what they're going through and how they overcame things um, because we're all facing the same problem. I'm a patient as well, so. Yeah, you know, and when I was doing this and when we were actually working on the curriculum last year, you know, time gets ahead of you sometimes and I'm due to actually get a new machine soon. So I'll be going back to my DME. Um, but it actually motivated me because the tools are out there. We've provided the tools for people to start a group. And there's some areas, you know, in, in your neighborhood, in your state, wherever you are, that may not have that peer-to-peer -peer support. And it's very important. I am impressed that Cindy has 25 to 50 participants. I think it's great, even what we see in our Awake page on Facebook, that people share experiences, they help each other, because even though we're going through a therapy ourselves, we may not have all the answers because we're not experiencing the things that maybe people experience out there. So I really encourage people to, you know, write that down, talk about your experience, ask for help, and somebody else that's going through the same issue may be able to help you. So again, it's actually when I go to my DME office next week, I'm actually going to ask them if they have a group and, and I'm going to consider running one myself, thanks to Cindy's work and the work that we're doing um, on our curriculum. So please stay along and um, feel motivated. Yeah. Um, I also just wanted to say, even if you have a PAT machine, um, with all the advances in equipment and therapies, it's really a good idea to ask about new technology. Of course, yeah. Things are changing all the time. And um, what fits today may not fit tomorrow. Right. Well, the new thing, um, just to touch on that for, for a moment, I mean, they're always coming out with new and different masks. Um, you know, the mask that I started out wearing is nothing like the mask I'm wearing yeah. now. I enjoy the one that I have now 10 times more. So, you know, by working with your uh, DME or the other acronym that Cindy said before, I can't remember what she said. Yeah. <laughs> HME, um, you know, you might be able to see some new new products that are out there. Um, I wanted, are we going to go through questions two and three? Uh, it's, it, well, so two, I think we already went through. Yeah, one thing I just wanted to mention in regards to number two was that um, for people that are new to their uh, uh, diagnosis and getting their equipment, um, when I read question number two, I kind of thought about, you know, what do you need to do? Well, you need to use your machine and you need to use it every night, all night, on vacation, when you nap, you know, all of those other types of things that it's not just something that, um, you know, your physician wants you to wear for <clears throat> two or three hours or not take on a vacation with you. Um, you know, if you have been on uh, a plane recently, you have probably seen about four or five other people <laughs> with some sort of CPAP bag that they have <laughs> sitting next to you. At least I do. I Maybe my eyes are a little uh, attuned to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I definitely want new patients and, and people that are, that are new to know that you're supposed to wear it every time you sleep, which takes place at least once in a 24 hour period. If you yeah. don't. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. Yeah. Um, so the next slide. Sure. Um, I cannot tell you how many people who wear a CPAP mask. Uh, mistake the abbreviations CPAP for CPAC. In fact, I read CPAC is one of the Google's most frequently searched terms 
relating to the therapy of sleep apnea. So of course, learning the correct pronunciations will help you understand your disorder and it will help others to know um, what you're talking about. So um, also you need to make sure that CPAP, that you know that CPAP is not oxygen. Um, CPAP stands for continuous positive airway pressure and it is a breathing therapy device that delivers a continuous pressure of air to a mask worn over your nose and or mouth um, to help consistent breathing. So this combination is why it's called continuous positive airway pressure or CPAP. Um, and it's a fixed pressure of air and it's continuously delivered to your airway. So um, this flow of pressure helps to keep the airway open while you're sleeping. Um, and obviously, you know, that's going to help you to um, breathe much easier. Your oxygen level is going to be um, much better that way as well. Yeah. You know, and I think we included a slide like this because I, I was surprised actually that CPAC was one of the one, number one Google um you know, terms down there, but people do get it confused. And, you know, in the medical field, a lot of people use acronyms and we'll get to that later. Um, but it's important, that's a very important uh, thing to understand because, you know, regardless of how you get your machine, when it arrives or how it arrives, you need to really know how it works. And I think knowing that it'll keep your airway open and it's not oxygen, and it's just supporting that, you know, collapsed airway so that you're not going to stop breathing is very important for people to understand. Um, and that certainly helps with, um, you know, the terminology that people are using and just understanding the actual treatment itself. I heard uh, something interesting uh, just a while ago because I often associated uh, sleep apnea with saying, you know, I have a, I have a sleep condition, um, yes. which it is a sleep condition. However, it's, 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 it's a breathing condition. You know, that's why it's my breathing is interrupted. Um, that's why my sleep gets interrupted, you know? So um, I just thought that that was interesting, you know, a, a way to, I never thought about it like that before. You know, uh, whereas maybe people that have, uh, you know, something like insomnia, it's a little different, you know, sure. um, that it's, yeah, that it's, it's, it's a breathing, I'm having a breathing problem while I'm sleeping. Um, so I just, yeah, I, I never thought of it that way. Yeah. And, you know, nobody wants to feel like they're suffocating, you know? Right. right. So again, this supports the airway, it keeps it open and patent and allows you to get oxygen into the lungs and the vital organs, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, just what you're mentioning about, you know, uh, uh, one of the suffocating and one of the common things that, you know, I'm sure Cindy has heard throughout her career, you know, I can't wear the mask because I'm claustrophobic and it makes me feel like I'm suffocating. And, you know, getting with other peers in a, in a, in a group like this, in an online group like this, getting face to face, um, the group that, you know, uh, sit like Cindy would have in person, um, can help you overcome those hurdles that everybody new to CPAP pretty much has. Yeah, of course. Great. Okay. Go to the next, next one. one. Yep. Okay. All right. So as you can see on this slide, apnea means no breath and a hypopnea means little breath. So obstructive sleep apnea or OSA is a type of apnea caused by a blockage of the airway, usually when the soft tissue in the back of the throat collapses during sleep. And a hypopnea is a partial collapse of the airway during sleep. So the way we measure the severity of your sleep apnea is with the apnea hypopnea index or the AHI. And that's something that you'll hear a lot. Um, it is the number which is calculated by the number of apneas and hypopneas um, that occur each hour. Or another way of putting it is it's the number of times per hour of sleep that your upper airway 
partially or completely collapses. So um, in numbers terms, an AHI less than five per hour is normal. Um, five to 15 per hour is mild. 15 to 30 is moderate. And um, an AHI greater than 30 is severe. So um, those are the kind of um, numbers. It's really um, important for you to know that. And again, you're going to hear AHI a lot. Yeah. You know, I mean, we, we discussed this slide too. I think it's important now that a lot of machines you can monitor um, every day what your AHI is. And it's important for you to know this. And again, as we go through this, I can't you know, I keep thinking that if somebody's newly diagnosed, this is all overwhelming. But it'll become second nature because when you get used to your therapy, you're monitoring it, which we would like you to do. All these things will help you understand exactly what's on going on with you during the night when you sleep. So if you've started off, hopefully, you know, not with over 30, but some people do. But if you've got you know, mild to severe sleep apnea, and you see with therapy that that's decreasing every night that you sleep, then it's actually good motivation for you to say, well, this, this therapy is working for me. And now I'm down to eight or 10, for example. So, you know, again, when you think that you're not getting that breathing and oxygen that's serving all your vital organs, we will come to that later, but, you know, there's so many now that's coming out there, and I'm sure there'll be a lot more, comorbidities associated with sleep apnea. So it's not just a problem that you're snoring or you're not breathing at night. This is a real concern. So it's a really important slide for people to understand and keep in tune with their therapy. And I just wanted to um, mention one more um, type of apnea, which is less common form of apnea, um, but it's central sleep apnea mm -hmm. or CSA. And unlike um, obstructive sleep apnea, the airway is not blocked, but the brain fails to signal the muscles to breathe. Sure. So I just wanted to mention that one as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, oh, uh, oh, yeah. I just wanted to say one thing. I, you know, um, um, one time somebody told me that, you know, having um, sleep apnea is like running a marathon all night. You know, you're, you're, as you talk about, um, all the effects that it has on your body and all of your other organs, you know, at night you're supposed to, your body is repairing, sleeping, uh, you know, and, and getting the restorative, uh, part of its day. And when you're constantly having those interruptions, because, of breathing and, and some other things that might be happening with, with your apnea, you know, your heart is working extra, your lungs are, your stomach is, everything, your muscles are, uh, everything is. And so you're really not getting that downtime. Um, you know, that could be why maybe um, one, of the, one of the big complaints is that you feel so tired during the day because you're not getting any, of, you're running the marathon at night. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you're not getting that REM, you know, you're, you're waking it up before you go into that phase. Right, right. And you wake it up over and over and over again, and you don't even really realize it. Yeah, which is good, because I think the next slide can speak a little bit more to that, too. Yeah. So have you ever been kicked out of a room or maybe even a house because of snoring? About 90 million Americans suffer from snoring during sleep. While half of these people are simple snorers, the other half may have obstructive sleep apnea. So more than just being noisy and interrupting other people's sleep, uh, someone who snores may have sleep apnea and sleep apnea can have serious health consequences. And just like we were talking about a minute ago, there is evidence that OSA leads to greater risk of high blood pressure, heart attack, stroke, um, congestive heart failure, atrial fibrillation, diabetes, certain cancers, and even sudden death. It can trigger the release of stress hormones, can change how your body uses energy, and makes you feel tired and sleepy during the day. 
Um, in addition, untreated sleep apnea may be responsible for poor performance in everyday activities, even such as work and school. So, um, and the majority of research indicates that obstructive sleep apnea is a significant cause of motor, motor vehicle accidents. Um, and snoring has been long considered a warning sign or a risk factor for developing obstructive sleep apnea. Yeah. So I know most of the people that are probably out there that are watching this, we know this is serious. Um, again, evidence is coming out, you know, a lot to say how serious it is. I think you look back at 10 years ago, maybe just people thought, well, you're not getting a good night's sleep and you're snoring or you're tired all the time. Let's see if this therapy will help you. But it's interesting now that it's been attributed to so many diseases and, um, again, comorbidity factors that are that are serious. So I want you to consider that when you're thinking of, um, you know, do I have to wear this mask? It's so obstructive for me. Or, you know, I, I was talking to the girls last week when we were just, you know, practicing for this session. And when I was at the office one time getting my new mask, a newly diagnosed patient who was probably in her late 50s or early 60s. And, you know, I got my mask, my tubing, whatever. And she's like, do you wear that every night? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, not that I have long hair. <laughs> but she was concerned. She was like, but doesn't it wreck your hair and mark your face? And I'm like, believe me, it's better than having a stroke or atrial fibrillation, you know? And this is the kind of down and dirty sometimes where you have to get to people because it's not a vanity thing. It's not a, I just want to be waking up energized, which is a benefit, of course. It's, um, no, I don't want to develop heart failure or, you know, a stroke or sudden death. So it's very important for people that are out there that may be tuning in tonight that are thinking, am I a candidate for this or not, um, go get a sleep study, you know, go get a sleep study and they will figure it out. Um, for me, I, you know, I'm, I'm a healthcare professional. I knew I snored and I could wake myself up by, you know, snoring and stopping breathing. And I used to think it was a panic attack. I also used to think that the lack of energy that I had was just due to aging. Now, I was lucky enough or unlucky enough, whatever way you look at it, that someone videoed me while I was sleeping. And I could see the position I was in. I was lying on my back with my arms above my head. I think I've said this before. My legs wide open, but that was for me physiologically to try and get air into my system. It was my body's way of saying, you're not breathing, you're not getting the oxygen, you need to lie in this position and get air into your vital organs. So if you're someone who lives on your own and maybe does wake up, you know, gargling or with a panic attack, consider doing that. Consider doing a sleep study because no one maybe can tell you that there's something fundamentally wrong with your sleep pattern. And I just want to say that the, um, the sleep studies now are much different than they used to be. They still have the in-lab studies, but mm -hmm. they have a lot of home sleep studies, which you come in, pick up a machine, take it home, and you just bring it back the next day. So it's, you know, it's nothing like it used to be. Um, they still do some of those, but most of it is just home studies now. I would like to just uh, give a shout out to the um, bed partners or roommates of, uh, of a major snoring individual. Um, and, uh, you know, talk about that for a moment because, you know, sometimes a lot of people don't think about it, but, you know, your sleep is getting fragmented and interrupted as well by yes. this yeah. other individual's problem. Um, and so it is actually in everybody's, both people's best interest to, you know, talk to your healthcare provider and, um, you know, see what the problem is and, and what can be done about it. Because 
um, whether you are uh, waking up unknowingly due, due to sleep apnea, or you are woken up, you know, five, six, 10 times a night because you're nudging your bed partner to stop snoring. Um, they're both, you know, not, not giving either individual um, the type of restorative sleep uh, that they need. Yeah. You know, and I think sometimes when we were looking, you know, last year, Justine, when we were doing these slides, it's almost like I remember thinking about this slide and thinking it was a little bit redundant because we were capturing people who maybe already had just a newly diagnosis. But there's also the question of you, you're newly diagnosed, but maybe you realize that your own sleep partner is doing the same but you've been too tired to realize, mm -hmm. or, you know, someone comes along to you and says, Oh, I wake up tired and I'm, you know, I, I think I'm snoring or the people next door tell me I'm snoring. I used to hear the guy, you know, where we lived, we were neighbors in San Francisco, old mm -hmm. wooden building. I heard, I heard my neighbor upstairs snore. Right. So it's almost a way of like, I thought, yeah, this slide's good because it, it makes people think about how we can help other people in the same situation. Yeah. Yep. Right. Okay, so um, this slide is pretty self-explanatory. It's just showing the difference between an open airway um, versus a blocked airway. And that's, you know, you can see, you can, you know, definitely see the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and I think a narrowed airway, you know, when you look at hypopnea, it's even a narrowed airway, um, you're not getting the same vital oxygen and airflow. Obviously, a blocked airway, we have sleep apnea. So again, you know, the therapy is induced to, to keep that open and patent so that you can get good breathing and oxygen. Right. So, yeah. When, when I was, um, I, I actually do not have sleep apnea. I have um, UARS, upper airway, I say resistance syndrome. I think that's the right accurate word for the acronym. Um, and, um, you know, instead of holding my breath for 10 seconds or more, I hold it for seven. Um, sometimes it's, you know, my own personal statement with having uh, sleep apnea or a, or a breathing condition while you're sleeping is that it's kind of like in that realm of, well, are you pregnant or you're not? Because you either are or you're not. <laughs> you're not right. a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, am I breathing like I'm supposed to while I'm sleeping or am I not? <laughs> Um, and so yeah. even when it's yeah. narrowed, I mean, yes, you are, you know, it's, it's a hypopnea. It's, you are still breathing your AHI that Cindy talked about before would be lower mm -hmm. than actual having a blockage, but you know, it's something you definitely want to keep, um, an eye on because, um, you know, as we get older, as you were saying before, Kevin, you thought your low energy and so forth was just, you know, related to, to, to aging. And I mean, um, you know, none of our tissues and muscles uh, stay as taunt and vibrant as we age, including <laughs> your airway, <laughs> yeah. and all the muscles there. So, um, you know, that's just something to keep in mind, you know, about that. Yeah, great point. Yeah. Um, and so, this is what a um, breathing looks like on a sleep study. Um, on the left, the waveforms represent normal breathing while sleeping. And on the right, the waveforms represent abnormal breathing. And in this case, um, you can see that there's really no breathing at all. So this would be an apnea. Um, and this can happen hundreds of times a night, night after night. So that's why everybody's tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, I love this slide because I think as we talked about this before, everybody understands, we all watch, you know, medical programs and everybody understands a flat line, you know, if it's an EKG monitor and it's a flat line, it's like, oh, they've gone, you know. So obviously on the left, we have a beautiful pattern of, you know, consistency. And on the right, you know, there's some variance and then there's a flat line. 
So to associate that flat line, we're not saying that, you know, someone's flat lined, but it's like, that's no activity at all. So I think people, especially people that are out there that are more visual can understand that, oh, is that really happening to me? You know, and, you know, as much as you can tell people what happens to them as far as AHI as a number, I think if you saw somebody, you know, or somebody who was more visually minded that seen that in a graph form would understand that really this is what's happening to me every night. I go a beautiful waveform and then it just goes flat. So I think that's a great slide for um, encouraging people to, you know, adhere to the therapy and understand how important it is. And again, even though this is for people that are newly diagnosed, we want to instill the importance of the therapy by reinforcing what can happen when you're not on it. So I, I really like this slide actually when we were doing it. Yeah, this kind of reminds me, you know, when I when I look at the right and I see those high peaks and valleys, I think of that marathon that I was talking about before and yeah. you running. Because I'm sure, you know, as I'm sitting here at the desk, my breathing is probably pretty much like the left, you know, in and <laughs> yeah. out, nice and smooth. But if I started to run a marathon, I'm pretty sure my breathing would be, you know, all these, you know, big inhalations and exhalations. I'm sure they would continue, you know, hopefully I wouldn't hold my breath that long while I was running. But nonetheless, you know, that's, that's when you're sleeping, that's, you know, an interesting thing to, to, to consider that you're breathing that hard while you're sleeping, um, you know, trying to get that oxygen to the rest of your body. Yeah. Cause it should be a restful phase, right. you know, when we're sleeping, that's when we rest. So you want a nice rhythmic, beautiful breathing. That's calm. You don't want all these variances where you're struggling and then it's, you know, you're struggling to get air in. And mm -hmm. like you said, the peaks and valleys go up. And then there's the flat line, you know, obviously not good. Yeah. Uh, so um, SA, OSA, CSA, AHI, PAP, CPAP, APAP, BiPAP, DME, HME. Now we have a good idea what all these letters stand for, I hope. When I started in the sleep lab 19 years ago, I had no idea what most of these abbreviations meant. Um, it looked like alphabet soup to me. Um, mm -hmm. Does anyone else think so? <laughs> yes, definitely. And you know, as I, I think I said to you in our practice session, you know, people in the medical field, they use abbreviations. Um, and because it's easier to say, you don't have to splur out these big continuous positive airway pressure, you can abbreviate to CPAP. I think the important thing about this slide here is just, it's not to overwhelm people about all the abbreviations, but people speak in that language and it's just important to know what they're talking about. You know, being the most important is, you know, SA, sleep apnea. I think, you know, when we talk about AHI, I think that's really important to understand what that means. PAP, positive airway pressure, or it can be called CPAP or BiPAP or APAP. It's, it, they're, they're all good to know what each individual um, acronym means. So people that are talking to other people, maybe in peer-to-peer -peer groups, may use these terms. And I think it's okay for people, like I'm in the medical field or nursing field. Sometimes I read something and it's abbreviated and I'm like, what is that? And then when someone tells me, I'm like, ah, you know, but terms can be dangerous as well. But I think these are, they sound a lot and it does sound like an alphabet soup, but they are related to our issues that are going on. So do try and familiarize yourself with these terms because people in your community will probably use those as well. And they're a lot easier to say. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Now we should have a good idea what these abbreviations mean. I think we have touched on all the abbreviations except for the last two. Um, we didn't speak about APAP, which um, is much like a CPAP machine, but instead of giving you a continuous pressure, it automatically adjusts the pressure um, to meet each specific person's breathing needs, which often changes throughout the night as we change positions and um, we go in and out of different stages of sleep. Yeah. So, and um, the last one was the BiPAP, which is a breathing therapy device as well, but it delivers two distinct pressures, um, one for inhalation and the second for exhalation. And uh, this is usually used for people with very high pressures or for people with lung disorders or certain uh, neuromuscular disorders. So I just wanted to also um, touch on those sure. as well. And that's important. So um, in conclusion, I think the more that you know about your diagnosis, the more questions you can ask others and the more they will be able to help you and you'll be able to help others. Great, Cindy, very good. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Now, one question I do have, um, I know you haven't used this particular, these particular slides because they are new, um, but you do have a lot of participants in your class. Can you just give us an example of some of the questions when someone is newly diagnosed? What are some of their fears, anxieties, or questions around the whole therapy that they get? I think um, most of the, you know, the questions that end up being um, asked are um, the more simple ones, but, um, you know, just about the face mask and, um, you know, which face mask should they use? Should they use a full face mask or a nasal mask or a, a nasal pillows? What is the difference between them? Um, you know, how long do they have to wear their mask and do they have to wear it every night? Um, you know, do they have to bring it you know, with them on vacation. A lot of them try and ask the manufacturers, like we talked about earlier, about uh, different headgear so, you know, it doesn't mess up their hair. Um, you know, the, the straps on the face and, and the lines. Um, all those things are, are things that they kind of talk to each other about and, um, you know, help each other figure out maybe, you know, if you try this or you try that, then, um, you know, it, it might work for you because it works for me. Right. You know, and I think one thing that we talked about during the week was, you know, when you do get your quote unquote prescription from the doctor, I think you had said that you help navigate that system because some people are overwhelmed by, am I going to have to go and pick up the machine? Is it being delivered? How long will it take? Can we just expand on that a little bit to, you know, share experiences about what happens after you do get a prescription? Sure. Um, I think for most, um, it's it's really different depending on what your insurance company is, um, who the home care company is, because you, you will either um, go to pick up your machine or... Um, You'll, some home care companies do come to the house and then um, some may actually get mailed. So, um, but you need to keep on your doctor to make sure that the prescription was written. And then, um, like I said earlier, you know, make sure you know the name of the home care company that they're calling for you. And that way you can, um, you know, talk to them as well if you need to call them. Sure. Well, one um, thing, um, can I just chime in uh, on course. this topic for a moment? Thanks. Um, one thing I'd like, you know, uh, new patients to know and to realize is that, um, you know, your insurance will probably dictate the type of equipment company that you are able to go to. Um, However, the, uh, most of the equipment that they have there, you know, they might only show you a small portion of what actually is on the market. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you are so inclined to 
you know, research a little bit about machines and masks. And just because they show you these five nasal masks doesn't mean that that's the only five that are out there. There's hundreds out there. Um, So, you know, you might want to, if you're not, if you're not feeling satisfied with the options that you're getting, um, probe a little bit more. I mean, there are tons of resources online that, you know, you can look at all different types of masks and machines and this, that, and, you know, talk to your DME about, you know, wanting to try something that they haven't shown you if you, if you think that that might be helpful for you. That's also, um, you know, when you go to the awake meeting, uh, we have a lot of vendors there. We have a lot of manufacturers there and and they usually will bring their newest supplies with them. Um, And then, you know, you, you can also ask, if, if you have looked online, saw something that you wanted, um, you know, you can ask them and see if they have, you know, if they brought it with them, so. You know, Sunday, I wanna play devil's advocate, okay? So say for example, we have someone who is visually impaired, they get their box in a, or their um, machine in a box, sorry, and is there, opportunity or resources for someone to help sort them out set it up because they've got this new equipment they don't really know what to do with it are they instructed about that before they leave the the uh, dme or office yes the, um they're uh whether they're whether it's done at home or whether they go to the office they do um explain to them how to use it um, you know, uh, obviously, you know, what kind of water to use, um, putting together the mask, cleaning the mask, um, that type of stuff. Um, I'm not sure what happens if, if it gets mailed to them and, um, every once in a while that does happen. So I, I for some reason, I think there might be like a, a video that comes with it or something, but, um, sure. I mean, obviously, we've got a variance of um, people with different disorders, different things going on. And I'm just like curious to see. I mean, I was given mine on hand and someone showed me, you know, set it up, use distilled water, plug it in, put it on, sit and read a book and away you go. But some people can be overwhelmed with new equipment and thinking it's. I mean, it is very easy. We all know that but others may feel, you know, a little bit overwhelmed. So I'm just wondering if, yeah, those resources exist and that's good. Yeah, I think they do. And I think that, um, you know, you can always call them back as well and make sure that, you know, if you do have a question that they will answer it for you. Sure. And if if nothing else, they can call the sleep lab and uh, we'll help them. (laughs) Good, good. I had a I have a Facebook question here from Victor. Great. And, um, this is a common thing that a uh, common question uh, for people that are starting out on their CPAP treatment. I'm sure Cindy has heard this before. Um, that Victor's problem is uh, stuffiness when he wears his full face mask, and he feels he's tried every adjustment and nothing seems to work. And in fact, he feels like he gets less sleep using the mask <laughs> because he's often, you know, feels like he's waking up and fidgeting with it and this, that. And what, are there any suggestions that maybe he, uh, you can think of, he could see if he um, hasn't tried yet? Um, probably even uh, like, a, I'm not sure if he uses a nasal spray. Um, you know, we have the... Um, neti pots, you know, that type of stuff that, that may help, um, you know, the adjustment of the humidification, you know, Mm -hmm. maybe something as well. I would even maybe suggest too, if, you know, constant stuffiness might get you in to see an allergist. Yeah. Um, And, and, you know, I was going to say that actually, Justin, it's a great point because I actually, um, Now the weather had got cooler and I'm using, you know, in my apartment, it's dry heat. It's like, you know, forced air. So the the first symptom I had was like sort of dry, itchy skin. And then I was like, oh, I need to go back down to storage and get my humidifier back out. 
And I actually realized when I had my humidifier on in the bedroom that I, I felt like my whole sleep was better, even though, of course, I'm using the humidification and in the machine. But it just created a nicer environment as well. But I think you're right. I mean, you, there could be something else going on and not just the, the, the mask or therapy. So I would try and sort that out first. But look at some humidification in the actual environment as well. Yeah, I mean, if if you're if you just are a person that has various types of you know environmental, therefore nasal allergies and inflammation, um, it's going to be hard to breathe when you're sleeping, anyways. Whether you wear a mask or not, so um, maybe seeking some 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 help on that matter um, might be able to resolve it for you. Yeah. Okay. Any other there, questions? There was a question here. Let me see on here on this chat um, from Janet, but we might have to talk offline to Janet. Um, she was hoping to get some information about uh, coexisting insomnia. She's been a successful BiPAP uh, user for several months. Her okay. events are under three but it sounds like maybe she's having some insomnia now. Do you, have you had any of that with some of your uh, patients or group attendees, uh, Cindy? Um, not really. And if, you know, I, I would first say that, oh, well, you know, maybe she's just having a hard time getting used to the machine and is not sleeping. But if she's, you know, been on it for a while, then um, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. At this stage, I mean, I always, yeah, this is a junked therapy. There, there's other, you know, sometimes we hear, you know, even when I look at the Awake Facebook page and some, some people say I started with a mask and the expectation is to, oh my God, I'm going to feel really great. And certainly I did, you know, I, I can't deny that, but not everybody has the same outcome. But you also have to bear in mind, like, you know, Victor earlier with maybe there's something going on sinus or environmentally or allergic reaction. But, you know, there, there's something else going on in this CPAP or BiPAP or APAP just doesn't fix anything. It'll help alleviate your OSA. But you have to be mindful that there should be there could be other things that are going on. And, you know, you should look into that as well. Yep, fully agree. Any other questions, Justine? I don't have any other questions. We had a lot of comments and someone had said, no questions, just thank you for doing, doing this and the work that you're doing. So that's great. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, listen, I want to thank Cindy again and, and you know, it is great when um, we we reach out to participants in our group and they're willing to come on and, you know, get out of their comfort zone and, and do this. I think it's wonderful the work you're doing with your, your, your patients. And um, certainly, you know, it has motivated me as well to start a group here, watch the space. And again, always, Justine, thank you for contributing. You're always great and a great advocate for um, the patients um, that are, are suffering with um, sleep apnea and, and various uh, sleep disorders and COPD. Lots of great work that's been done there. Thank so you. So we Can always I welcome as well questions or, you know, comments or um topics that you may want um you know we're going to try and run these every month again this year so if you have something that you're particularly interested in that you want to hear about or you even want to bring yourself forward and discuss some things yourself we'd be happy to have you on board uh, one thing before we, we, we part with our audience, um, we talked a little bit about it in the beginning about the uh, ASAA's AWAKE uh, network um, mm -hmm. and the groups, peer-to-peer -peer groups that, you know, Cindy and other individuals like her have across, uh, across the U.S., um, we are really trying to make a push to, you know, increase 
the number of groups that we have this year. Um, Awake has been around, I'm blanking on the year right now, but I, since 1990, I believe. So, <laughs> and actually was started um, as a peer to peer uh, group with uh, patients helping patients and talking about their experience and what did you do with this and how did you overcome that? And that's all very helpful. It's exactly what we're doing tonight. Um, uh, uh, and, and that information is, 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 is always helpful to someone that's new or um, you know, someone that's experienced always has information to give and to share. So that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a lot of individuals like Cindy who um, their clinic or their office or their healthcare organization um, you know, runs uh, an awake group in a particular area. And that's great too. They have their mm -hmm. resources to experts um, and healthcare providers that, you know, can give a little bit more detailed information than a peer can. Um, but they're both still very helpful, um, you know, to, to patients. So, you know, if anyone is interested in uh, starting a peer group, you can visit our website that's up there, www.sleepapnea.org. I think it's funny I just said the www part. Yeah. <laughs> just sleepapnea.org. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, and if there's, you know, people that want to encourage uh, their doctor's office to start, uh, yeah. to start a group, um, you know, they can, they can tell them to visit our website and take a look at it. The type of materials that you saw today are what we're providing uh, individuals and groups that, that Cindy and others are running, um, you know, to help with the messaging and give you the tools that you need to start the discussion and keep the discussion going. So, yeah. yeah, and I think it's a great point. And I mean, again, we want to motivate people to do this. But if you feel you're somewhere and you feel alone, nobody wants to feel that. And yeah, there's great resources out there with our Awake um, Facebook page. But if you're the type of person like me that likes, you know, contact, discussion, more narrative than written, maybe just consider opening up a, you know, a, a group where people can meet periodically and just discuss things. And even if it doesn't have to get that clinical, just talk about your experience and share your experience and, and just know that there's other people out there like you helps you, you know, um, adhere to therapy and think that, yeah, this is the norm for me now and I'm going to work with it. So it's a great idea. It can be social, clinical, informative, however you want. It's great. Yeah. But as Justin said, we have the tools to provide you with, you know, information that is good, good and sound. We had one more question sneak in from Carol before we before we okay. break up. I okay. think it's a good one. Um, you know, how often should you be checked? So here you are, you you got your diagnosis, you got your machine and stuff. You know, what comes after that with going to the doctor? Are you going to have another sleep study? Do you have to go back to the doctor every month, or what's the process? Maybe. Uh, Cindy, can you maybe paint a little picture about what happens? Uh, I, so I think at the beginning, um, so we have a clinic at, a, at our place. So at the beginning, you would go, um, you know, after, after you're diagnosed, then you would go um, a few months later, then um, you would go yearly. But um, having the sleep study over again um, doesn't usually happen unless you you know, your symptoms return. Um, if you've, you know, gained weight, lost weight, that time type of thing. And then you, you know, you would have another sleep study. Sure. Can I just share my experience, what it's like here in Canada for me? Um, I go every six months uh, to the DME and, um, you know, mainly for supplies. They check my machine, they check quote unquote adherence. Um, those reports I'd asked about this before are funneled back to the, you know, the doctor that I'd seen initially. And if there's a problem, for example, if my setting needs adjusted, um, then they would alert the physician to say, well, actually, Kevin's having more AHIs. I think his setting needs to be increased or not. 
So, you know, it's not just to look at adherence. They're always happy to say, oh, you're doing at least 7.5 hours a night and that's great. And your AHI is down to three, for example. But it's also to funnel back again, like I said, to the physician to say, well, maybe this is the problem now because there is a lifestyle change. There is a weight gain. There is a something that's making the AHI increase. And therefore, you would need to go back to your doctor's office and see them about adjusting your um, your your therapy. I don't know, Cindy, if that would ever, you know, include another sleep study. I think they can get a lot of information out of the machines these days to mm-hmm. not need that. Um, so, yeah, for us, it's every six months. Great. Okay. I think that might be it with the question. Are we good to wrap? I think so. <laughs> Listen, thank you, guys. And again, I encourage your comments, um, questions, and um, we will try and get to them. We're not experts. We can only share our own experience. And um, But if you have a topic, again, that you'd like us to discuss, or if you're someone out there who would like to come on to our Facebook Live, please feel free to um, jot us down or jot us a line and say, you know, I'd be interested in discussing this and we'd be happy to have you on board. Thank you so much again to Cindy and Justine. Good night all and sleep well. Bye. Bye.